you, Peter. And uh, it's um, genuinely uh, very good to be here um, again. Uh, now, my aim is uh, to describe, if I can, uh, key points in the um, strategic environment uh, in which the ADF um, has to operate and is going to have to operate in the future and possibly in the long term. And I'll start by saying um, and uh, acknowledging that this strategic environment is complicated. Uh, and long term. <clears throat> uh, it's uh, here you can see a quote on the on the slides um, uh, that this is um, this is the kind of thing you hear people like former CIA director John uh, Brennan uh, saying that they've never seen a world which looks more complicated, uh, more um, uncertain. Um, and because uh, I know why he says this. I mean, just for example, you know, I travelled out from London at the end of the weekend, uh, passing through Singapore, being able to turn my machines on and off, and so on from uh, you know time to time, and uh, it was like being Rip Van Winkle, really, um, uh, looking, waking up and checking in and finding some new dramatic thing had happened, um, just over you know almost day by day. Obviously, I'm thinking particularly of the uh, London attacks, uh, but I'm also thinking of the surprise, you know, dreadfully brutal um, attacks in Manchester. Um, I come here and I hear about the Melbourne um, attacks. Uh, we're at the very end of an election uh, campaign um, at, at um, home. Just last week, uh, we had the uh, US uh, formal withdrawal from the Paris um, agreements. Um, uh, and of course, we've had big talks and conferences, Shangri-La, um, the US um, uh, cabinet uh, uh, leaders coming here, talking, um, uh, quite a lot of up upheaval in the Gulf and so on. So I know um, uh, what uh, John Brennan is talking about. Um, at the same time, I'm really very keen to make the point in a, co uh, in a conversation like this that the world's always been unstable. This is the centenary year of 1917 in Australia. That means something. Are we really saying that we face a more difficult situation now than we did in 1917? Of course, uh, we're not. Uh, we really do need to keep things in perspective. Also, at the same time, we have to think, well, why do serious people like Director Brennan uh, say uh, these things? And uh, my immediate answer to that is they say it because of this. Another former CIA director, sorry, I keep on going around quoting CIA directors, but this is because um, MI6 directors don't really speak in public very much, <laughs> so I can't easily quote them. Um, and this is the point that Mike Hayden <coughs> uh, is, is making. Of course, the world has been more dangerous, immediately dangerous in the past than you know, on occasions in the past than it is today, but it's never been more complicated, and then the key word is immediate uh, than it is now. And that's the issue, really. It's change. It's the speed and the scale of the change which is happening as, around us, as I've just hinted, almost day by day, certainly year by year, and decade uh, by uh, decade. And I'll just try very quickly to sort of give a bit of quick background on that. Um, obviously, when we're talking about change, we're talking about technology and technology and, uh, and, and technology. I mean, we're increasingly aware of the fact that technology is changing our complete environment, you know, within which we live and which we uh, grow up and which we have our families and lead our personal lives and uh, run our bank accounts and goodness knows, uh, what else, um, <clears throat> uh, but it's just the overall scale of the change, which I'm quite anxious to um, get across here. This just shows uh, global internet usage. You'll note that the countries which actually have the maximum usage and the ones that don't quite have the maximum usage, the point being there that there's a lot more of this uh, still uh, to come. Um, <coughs> And again, we get 
a way of illustrating, I like the iPhone uh, 7 uh, um, equivalent uh, statistics. It's just a quick way of showing you what's going on in terms of uh, scale and speed. But of course, this also is intended to illustrate vulnerabilities. Um, uh, at present in the UK, um, uh, more or less half of all businesses in the last 12 months have acknowledged, have acknowledged at least one cyber security uh, breach. 51% uh, of all uh, breaches come from organized criminals. And of course that gets us into the subject of uh, not just vulnerabilities, but of attackers and the nature of attackers, whether they're hacktivists, whether they're organized criminals, as I've just said, or whether they're states, um, or whether they're a combination of all these things. But I mentioned states, um, and I just list here, um, of course, I'm thinking there above all, as indeed the Director of National Intelligence, again in the United States, said just a few weeks ago, the top of the list is Russia, um, with its focus on state interests and targets. Um, in second place now, in the DNI's view, um, demoted from first place, it's uh, China, with traditionally its commercial um, emphasis, but now moving to more and more to state targets. Obviously, it's North Korea. I'll come back to that when I talk about North Korea. Um, it's Iran. These are the sort of the major uh, countries, but you know we can go on and we can add to the list. It's quite embarrassing, actually, to mention one or two of the countries who are on the list, so I won't do it here uh, straight, uh, straight away. I thought I'd also just mention here, because it just seems a, a good way of, sort of getting across you know, in, in quickly and finally uh, some of the technology vulnerability points to refer to the WannaCry um, uh, ransomware uh, attacks um, of a few weeks ago. 150 countries effective, hundreds of thousands of computers um, effective. Um, and interestingly, a strong sense of surprise around the world uh, that this um, happened. And just thinking about it, you know, one can't help sort of noticing how the whole affair demonstrated a range of issues, um, really, which characterize the situation we're in at present. Um, the way in which the leak came, the WannaCry attack, if you like, came from a government NSA uh, capability, which had been leaked uh, by an outsider, by an insider, sorry, um, involving a hacker group, uh, in this case, shadow uh, brokers. Uh, it was known that the capability had been lost. Microsoft had produced and published a patch for it a couple of months in advance. This had not been applied you know, across very wide sectors of, um, uh, of the community, uh, and so the vulnerability uh, remained. And there's been a lot of speculation about nation state involvement through the hacker group, um, uh, or the group uh, Lazarus, which is linked, um, possibly, uh, to uh, North Korea, but t typically we're left a bit uncertain about, about that. So that one incident is telling you a lot about our present situation. Um, <clears throat> as I said, this is changing our entire um, uh, in environment, including the environment of defense, potential warfare, interstate conflict and competition, terrorism, of course, and politics, with the huge subject about which I could speak for over an hour of um, election um, interference. So, technology. And another big underlying change, which has affected our, our environment, is that the evolution of great powers. I just thought I'd sort of look up these statistics and then make a multiplication effect between 1990 and uh, 2015. Um, now, it may, none of this may be news to you at all, but I must say I was quite struck by some of these figures, and um, I'm quite glad to have got this um, slide because they sort of just remind us of certain things that we need to be reminded of when we're talking about a strategic environment. The first is, of course, uh, the, the, sort of the first place occupied by the United States. There's too much talk about the decline of American power. If you look at the realities, 
underpinning economic performance, and at the end of the day, that's what power is about, in my view. Uh, you see the reality in those figures. Uh, secondly, um, conversely, you see uh, the position of Japan now in 2015 compared to what it was in 1990 in relative terms. And you can see why there's a strong sense of national anxiety in Japan. And I might come back to that briefly a little bit later on. Um, but in a way, most strikingly, well, next, not most strikingly, but next is a very interesting point and reminder uh, that the, um, uh, uh, the GDP of the Russian Federation can't be compa compared exactly, of course, with the USSR in 1990 the Russian Federation which is about 145, 144 million people, um, is more or less the same as Australia with 24 million people. Well, I'm sure everybody in this room knows this fact precisely. Most people outside Australia don't know this fact. And when you mention it to people, they're pretty struck. Okay? Um, I'll certainly come back to that when I talk about Russia. But finally, and most importantly, if we're looking at multiplication factors, just look at China. Uh, um, and of course, the point about China uh, is, and I was halfway through my professional career in 1990. You know, it's a sobering thought. And of course, it brings with it you know, other massive changes in our global structure the growth of the middle class, uh, the reduction in people living below the poverty line, uh, very significantly the uh, uh, astounding growth in an urban uh, population. All this is linked uh, to what's happening in Asia generally, but of course with China um, in particular. Okay, enough of the general stuff. If we move on to specific uh, geopolitics and indeed um, with uh, China, uh, well, you know, chosen that um, as, uh, uh, as one way of, um, of putting it, uh, just trying to sort of comment on China's relationship with a range of countries across um, um, uh, Asia. And there are many points that can be made about China's evolving relationships uh, within um, Asia, however we define it. Um, and it varies, of course, and these vary country uh, by country. But there is an underlying theme and pattern there in most or many of these cases uh, where we see a degree of political competition, even confrontation, and certainly tension, uh, but all the same combined with a pattern of growing economy uh, ties as the strength of the Chinese economy um, asserts itself year in, year out. This, of course, includes Indonesia, uh, where there have been sort of, you know, pretty well open confrontation in the last year or two uh, between Indonesia and China around sort of fishing uh, vessels and so on, but at the same time, uh, increasingly strong uh, economic ties and links with the Asian um, Infrastructure Investment Bank. Even Vietnam, um, t January 2017, the 10-point uh, joint uh, communique on increased trade and investment ties. Of course, Malaysia, Thailand, Famously, uh, the Philippines. Um, uh, the one exception is the big bubble where uh, Japan, a special case. Um, I've always been struck by something a senior and very respected Japanese colleague said to me two or three years ago, uh, how with uh, China's move into number two position in the global e economy, uh, for the first time in its modern history, Japan is not the leading and most advanced country in Asia, and it never will be again. It knows it can't be. So even when it crashed to defeat in 1945, it crashed to defeat um, in, in the face of uh, conflict with a manifestly superior power. That shouldn't be the case um, in their minds with China, but it is. <coughs> that is a whole subject in its in itself. And now, of course, we have uh, one belt, uh, one road. We had the mid-May Beijing summit around this uh, theme, 
One Belt, One Road, uh, a massive, ambitious, historically based um, a scheme uh, involving 60 plus uh, countries, potentially 30% of global uh, GDP um, tied up with this in one way um, uh, or another. A clear, not very underlying message about the bid for future uh, global leadership, complete coincidence of course, uh, that it's announced at the same time as the um, build up of the new US administration. Um, come back to that, and of course uh, reflected also in Xi Jinping's uh, speech at Davos back um, in January. In geographical terms, as you can see, of course, aimed at Europe, and there are lots of questions about the European attitude uh, to, uh, to this. I'm not really sure what the answer to that is, but my own sort of experience, and I don't think I'm being completely subjective here, is that across Europe, uh, there's a mixture of confusion, uncertainty, and hesitation about all this, about one belt, one road, and most people don't really know what it means anyway, don't understand it, and know nothing about Chinese history, so they don't understand the buttons it presses uh, when it's talked about um, in, um, in Asia. Uh, but there is also a lot of quite well-aimed skepticism about what it actually means um, in reality, and it's only going to be effective as if it's one belt, one road, two way. And it's not completely clear that it is going to be two way, um, rather than you know, a mechanism for transporting uh, cheap uh, Chinese uh, manufactured uh, goods. And of course it also has to reflect um, a transparent and open economy um, in China, which it clearly doesn't do um, at the moment. Uh, but that's not, you know, to dismiss its significance, it's just to ask some really pretty obvious questions. It's also inevitably, given its root, got tied up with politics around the place, most obviously India and Pakistan. Um, and uh, it's not really, well, it's, it is sort of clear from the map here, the key role um, that the um, uh, Gwadar port in Pakistan uh, would play um, in this um, uh, in the scheme, which of course didn't go down that well with um, India. As it happens, actually, there's quite an interesting, very interesting article in Reuters um, yesterday um, about uh, uh, this um, issue, focusing on the situation um, at um, uh, Haragos or Karagos, as it is in Kazakh, which is on the border between uh, Western China and Kazakhstan. It's not marked on the map, but you can see where it would be. Uh, which is um, an international free trade uh, zone center um, uh, um, between China and Kazakhstan. In practice, it's developed over the last few years into uh, a tax haven, mainly for uh, Chinese business. Uh, and um, it also faces all sorts of blockages um, in terms of openness to trade, both into Kazakhstan because of Kazakhstan's position in the Eurasian Economic Union, which is resistant to cheap imports, um, and, but also uh, China itself importing back uh, the other way around. It's quite worth reading, actually, because it you know, illustrates uh, some key questions about this one belt, one road. Staying with China, um, we have, of course, obviously, um, the South and also East China Seas, but let's say the South China Sea um, issue also, which is um, potentially a dominating issue for all of you here and for the region. Um, but to remind you, gets very little attention back in Europe, gets a lot of attention in the United States, very little attention and understanding, uh, I find, uh, back um, in Europe. This is a developing uh, story, of course. The South China Sea uh, points to pick up immediately, uh, without going into too much detail, uh, the um, Center for Strategic International Studies, CSIS, in Washington, the uh, very interesting report, detailed report published uh, last month um, about the development of three major military bases uh, with naval, air, uh, radar, um, missile defense, facilities uh, being built um, uh, um, in, um, in the Spratly um, Islands and also the Paracels, and which give the capability um, for um, 
uh, combat aircraft and uh, mobile missile uh, um, launches deployment um, in the Spratly um, Islands. And this is within territory, of course, which is contested famously um, between China, Vietnam, Taiwan, Malaysia, uh, Brunei, and, of course, the Philippines. Uh, there's so much, again, that one could uh, say about this. Um, the um, arbitration court ruling uh, last year, which was absolutely categorical about, um, in support of the law of the sea, uh, ruling in favor of the Philippines' um, uh, uh, claim <coughs> uh, uh, that China had violated uh, their sovereign rights in an exclusive economic uh, zone. Um, <coughs> and uh, a ruling that was just flatly rejected uh, by uh, China, and which of course, uh, again famously, has not been effectively challenged, it is sort of in practice maybe being accepted by uh, the Philippines government, um, at least for uh, the moment. Um, this is a huge and complicated and very important strategic subject. Um, the key point that I like uh, to just to focus on is, well, how are we reacting to it? And in particular, how is the US reacting to it? Well, back in January, uh, Secretary Tillerson, one of his very first statements, um, gave this very uh, strong message um, in deliberate and intended contrast to um, uh, policy and activities uh, from the um, Obama administration about the toughening up of the position on the uh, South uh, China Sea. Lo and behold, uh, three months later or four months later, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee sent this formal message uh, to the White House saying, well, okay, you said these tough things back in January, but actually since then you've done nothing about it. In brackets, that's because you're much more concerned about North Korea and you don't want to stir things up with the Chinese in the South China Sea, close uh, brackets. Um, then, as is remarked at the bottom there, on the 25th of May, uh, just before the Shangri-La conference in Singapore, USS Dewey passed within 12 nautical miles of a mischief reef, uh, one of the areas where, of course, there have been um, military facility uh, developments in the South uh, China Sea. We had a tough statement which provoked uh, Beijing um, anger uh, from uh, the G7. Uh, we had further tough statements from the US side um, at the Shangri-La conference, and indeed, again, from Secretary Tillerson and Secretary Mattis um, in Australia just a couple of days ago. Um, <clears throat> and that's, you know, that's fine. Um, it's not... Um, I'll come back to that it's not actually clear what happens next. And I've been in quite a few discussions with US colleagues, um, uh, panels and so on, um, where officials are there and they talk in all the right way, but it's not clear what you do next. Because at the end of the day, rather like you have in um, Eastern Europe with Ukraine, a uh, completely different situation, but you have you know, a large power uh, which is right next door to the area of confrontation and has the natural strategic advantage of being right next door. And so if they really insist on their position, what uh, are you going to do about it? And at the moment, maybe somebody in a question will have the answer to this, but I personally don't see an easy way through this one. So this is going to be near the top of my list of big strategic worries for a long time to come. North Korea. Um, now this, of course, I'm going to talk about potentially dominating issue with the South China Sea, but in the immediate reality, this is the dominating issue uh, that everybody has to uh, think about. And again, it's such a complicated issue, it's extremely difficult to put up a slide which really gets across uh, your key point. But we are in a dynamic phase of this crisis with North Korea. Korea, where an absolutely major and remarkable effort is going on to test and develop, at the same time, uh, a whole range of missile capability. And in the last two months, uh, we've had major uh, developments in, in this area. Missile capabilities um, developed and demonstrated 
uh, to, uh, to uh, for example, in relation to the re-entry capability um, of a missile uh, going out of the atmosphere and coming back in again, obviously directly related to um, intercontinental ballistic missile capability in the longer term for a nuclear warhead. Um, we've had submarine launches, uh, and um, of course we've also had the demonstration of um, uh, the use of solid fuel, fuel um, missiles um, being moved um, on mobile uh, transport, uh, making it you know, very, very difficult, if not impossible, to, uh, to spot and uh, prevent um, in, in uh, advance. <clears throat> uh, again, that's a huge subject that I could talk about for a long time, get lost a bit in the technicalities. Again, we come back, as I've just done on the South China Sea, to what, above all, is the likely US reaction to this. We had some debate about this um, in a discussion uh, last night, which was pretty depressing. Um, you know, the standard position um, is that within the lifetime of the Trump administration, it is, you have to plan on the assumption that North Korea will develop the capability to launch and land a nuclear warhead on the continental United uh, States. Um, and it follows from that, you know, would any president from any administration be prepared to accept such a situation uh, to which the obvious and immediate answer is simply no. Um, it could be, given the progress which has been demonstrated very recently in the last few weeks, that the, uh, and this was in fact the outcome of the discussion we had last night, that that capability will come more quickly than uh, the lifetime of the Trump administration, assuming of course that that lifetime is another three and a half plus years. Um, uh, you know, it's a fast moving um, uh, situation. Uh, and, and again, if you stop to think about it, it's hard to think of something which is actually more worrying and more serious. Now, what is current uh, US policy on this? Uh, this is what Secretary Tillerson, again, um, has been saying. But obviously, the key word is at the end there uh, that um, a military response um, is an option which lies um, on the table. And this is backed up by significant uh, military deployments um, in the Sea of Japan, right next door to North Korea, of two uh, US carriers uh, there now. And it's backed up by the publicity given to the creation of a special operational action unit, or operational intelligence unit within uh, CIA. Um, uh, open statements of tough policy statements from uh, Tillerson and Secretary Mattis around the need to toughen up very significantly financial and other sanctions and indeed isolation as far as possible against uh, North uh, Korea. And it's worth reminding there are lots and lots of ways in which the North Korean um, economy is still relatively open to the outside world. Um, I mean, just quite simply, uh, garment industry, uh, coal imports, um, laborers, and the income coming back into the North Korean economy from uh, enforced, if you like, uh, subsidies from uh, foreign uh, laborers and, and, and so on. There are all sorts of ways in which it could be toughened up if you get into the detail, and if, above all, you have the right kind of support from, uh, from China. Um, this is all good, sensible policy, and it's clearly been put together in a sensible way um, after careful consideration of the options in the National Security Council. Um, uh, but um, you know, it is also uh, a lot of risk around it. Uh, displays of force in that way are famously uh, and notoriously open to misinterpretation. They carry risk. You may think that you're exercising deterrence, against the other side, but actually you might be provoking him into thinking something much more serious than that and uh, identifying even a policy of regime change. And if that was the conclusion which a guy like Kim Jong-un reached, then of course the way he would react would not be what you might desire. <clears throat> 
Uh, the problem for US policy in this area is that you've got to know pretty well for sure what Kim Jong-un is thinking, what's in his brain, how his policy thinking is developing. I'm not sure that anybody in Washington really can be certain about that. And perhaps even more importantly, you've got to be confident that you're reading and analyzing Chinese uh, policy objectives correctly um, as well. And, and again, I, I'm not sure uh, that uh, anybody in Washington is quite sure about that either. We all know the reasons why uh, China um, is reluctant uh, to intervene decisively in North Korea, fears the collapse of the regime, it fears the reunification of the peninsula under US uh, domination. It's reacted extremely strongly to the um, uh, missile deployment system um, in South Korea by uh, the US. Um, there is now a new government in uh, South Korea, which of course um, looks maybe more attractive and amenable in its emphasis on trying to find a negotiated uh, solution um, to, to the problem, although they've yet to um, explain uh, what that negotiated solution actually might look like. In other words, uh, you know, it is impossible to say what the solution is to this issue. Um, there's an element in our thinking, and I was saying this earlier on, that maybe, well, North Korea has always been difficult. They've always been a bit balmy. This is the way they always behave. We just have to pull up with it and manage it. Um, and you can see people thinking that when they watch Kim Jong-un's behavior, which is why, in a way, the um, outside world, um, even South Korea, may be relatively relaxed about what, on paper at least, you know, and when you look at it and you hear it being described in that way, is a very bad situation indeed, which is likely to come to a fruition or might come to fruition in the next few months and certainly two or three uh, years. But the other thing that I'd like to um, uh, uh, just finish on here, on this particular point, is what is this telling us about China? I mean, both what I've just been talking about with North Korea, but also um, in relation to the South China Sea and the One Belt, One Road and all the rest of it. Um, the first point, just to make bullet points, if you like, uh, is that in this region, China is becoming increasingly politically and militarily assertive. Its key objective, its top objective, is not to stop North Korea developing a nuclear weapon, almost certainly not. It is to limit and push back US power in, in the region. That is the top priority. Um, and its economy, as I've just been pointing out, gives it a strong card to play particularly when added to uncertainty about the direction of US policy. Um, <clears throat> um, and where key interests are at stake for China, and they believe they're key interests, they will simply uh, not back down. So don't assume that they will. And again, where necessary, they're capable of being ruthless. Right, to cheer you up. Uh, we come to the Middle East and North Africa, and I need to move quickly, I realize. Now, for me, based in Europe, um, at least for the moment, uh, and in, uh, in London, this is the subject which is you know, most in one's mind, day in, day out, the, the high-profile region, Middle East and North Africa, mainly for short, uh, of, of instability, which has the most immediate impact on the world in which I operate day by day, although, of course, um, you know, I'm fairly global in my approach. Again, uh, massively complicated. Uh, John Brennan, to quote him again, uh, referring to even just Syria on its own as the most complicated situation he ever encountered in his entire uh, career. Again, could talk for hours about this. I've got to keep it simple. And so I'm going to pick out just two or three key uh, themes or aspects which illustrate uh, maybe the sort of underlying features of the crisis in the Middle East and uh, North Africa, especially since 2011. The first definition, if you like, is that of state disintegration. You know, we talk fairly loosely 
about preserving the Syrian state and somehow or another putting it back together again. Well, look at that map. Good luck to you. Yeah. It is possibly impossible. That is the state of, I'm going to update this map virtually every week um, as uh, territories uh, change hands in, um, in, in control. The, the state of integration really started through the loss of control in Syria and, of course, elsewhere across uh, the, uh, the region, Libya, Iraq, Yemen, let's take the most obvious cases, much of it starting, not entirely, of course, um, with uh, the um, uh, upheavals of uh, 2011 and the fall of the Nasserite uh, um, rulers, authoritarian rulers, dictators, or whatever you call them, um, in many of these countries. You know, these are people, of course, who in the past I've known, um, some of them quite well, and I know that they were out of touch with the way the world had developed and their countries had developed, uh, the way they developed economically, demographically, and above all, um, technologically. Uh, a reminder, of course, that huge suffering has accompanied this upheaval. Um, five million people um, have fled uh, Syria since 2011, uh, and 6.3 million, so altogether half the population, um, have been displaced you know, internally or um, externally. And the death toll, well, people differ about the death toll, but uh, almost certainly it's about half a million people. Syria used to go there quite a lot. You know, a sophisticated, historically very developed country. Not a wild place at all. Um, <coughs> Yemen, just a reminder, is not just Syria, Iraq, uh, and of course, uh, Libya, uh, which has only been a state since 1951 and split much more rapidly than anybody anticipated into Salonika and Tripolitania and then the southern uh, sparsely populated uh, regions. Another sort of key feature is sectarian divide, which brings us uh, to Iraq in particular, but above all uh, to Iran. And the subject of Iran, um, which is linked from the sectarian divide to interstate tension of a really deep kind, most especially between Iran and Saudi Arabia. I've always thought that we, if you like, in the Western world, consistently underestimate the depth and intensity of the rivalry between and hostility between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And then we keep on being reminded just how deep and historical um, it really is. And it is now at the focus um, of attention and preoccupation for the uh, US administration, which back in February put Iran on notice, inverted commas, uh, not able to renounce um, formally uh, the nuclear accord uh, straight away, uh, but Iran on notice. It wasn't made clear at the time exactly what that meant. Um, since then, we've got a clearer idea of what it actually uh, does mean um, with the very strong language and focus on Iranian ballistic missile development, which is not actually technically part of the um, Iran uh, agreement and which the newly elected president has insisted is going to continue in, um, in um, Iran because we have elected presidents uh, there too, unlike one has to say in Saudi Arabia. Um, and of course, the Riyadh speech by the president, by President Trump, um, uh, two weeks ago, or just over two weeks ago, in which, amongst other things, he said, for decades, Iran has fueled the fires of sectarian conflict and terror. Until the Iranian regime is willing to be a partner for peace, all nations of conscience must work together to isolate Iran, as accompanied, of course, by further measures on sanctions being developed in Congress. This was a big thing to say, and it will have, and indeed already has, started having significant impact in the region. And you'll have been reading in the last few days about the um, rapidly increasing isolation of Qatar, um, by the other Gulf states led by Saudi Arabia, um, a crisis, if you like, building up for some months, 
but almost certainly related now in its culmination to what the president said two or three weeks ago in, in Iran. And it shows how quickly things can change in such a volatile um, uh, region. Moving on quickly with uh, the other key definition or two key definitions for the Middle East and North Africa sort of upheaval. First of all, in terms of its global impact, certainly its European impact, um, in terms of the migrant flows there, 2015 in particular, 2016, beginnings of 2017. And then, and we can debate the reasons for it, but the uh, decline very rapidly in global oil price starting in November 2014, and the extent to which that was or was not linked to Middle Eastern um, uh, politics. Um, <coughs> And then, um, <clears throat> a final point, terrorism. Well, again, I could talk about that for hours. I haven't got time. Um, it's just, I just quickly run through, and we're all thinking about this at the moment, you know, a range of, sort of key questions which we just have to think about when we're thinking about the terrorist flow. And of course, it's largely linked to uh, the Middle East and North Africa in origin the nature of the foreign fighter flow which has gone in to the conflicts in the last few years in Syria and Iraq, particularly from Western Europe, but not only from Western Europe, you know, certainly from Australia, um, and the way these networks might now behave and spread back again with the pressure on them in those territories. Um, the threat which returning refugees, or fighters rather, do um, or do not um, uh, present and how that is assessed. Uh, how do we assess the threat and understand and counter uh, uh, the threat from homegrown lone wolves, singletons, whatever we uh, call them? Uh, we mustn't forget the capacity still for very sophisticated and extremely damaging attacks like the ones in Paris in November 2015 to be organized still uh, from uh, Syria. What exactly is the, um, uh, the role of, um, uh, 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 of refugees um, in this situation? What's the role played by the availability or not of weaponry? It's difficult to get guns in the UK, but look at the attacks we've had. They haven't used guns, they've used knives and they've used trucks, if not quite on the scale yet, at least, of what happened in, in Nice last uh, July the role of social media, um, uh, just the sheer scale of the potential threat once you bring in homegrown uh, uh, activists and how do you counter that? It isn't just a question of resources. Um, and then of course the underlying key issue of integration in our societies, how do you manage that? Easy to speak about, extremely difficult to implement, certainly in the short term. And looking at it from a regional point of view, of course, this is a threat which is coming back into Southeast Asia, as was always predicted, it was likely to happen uh, to Indonesia, and of course, famously at the moment, um, to uh, the Philippines. It's prompting uh, further defensive and security collaboration between members of ASEAN, how effective that'll be um, in uh, practice. Um, you know, we'll have to We'll have to wait and, and see. Finally, just to introduce a good old subject, uh, Russia. Um, here, um, um, it's just a reminder, I'll have to move very quickly. Um, when we talk about Russia and Russian behavior, we have to talk about territory, a reminder of the territory that Russia has effectively lost since 1991, 1989, 1991. So we worry now about them grabbing back Crimea, but just look at what, in their eyes, they lost in the last 25 uh, years. And the role that that has played, and the history of that has played in the mentality and thought processes and policy making of the current Russian uh, leadership. Um, the way that thing has developed from the 1990s, uh, the, the resentments against what happened in the Balkans in the late 1990s, 
the role of the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, 2004, in Russian thinking, the way that thinking, uh, that change thinking, was expressed at the Munich Security Conference by Vladimir Putin in 2007. Of course, Ukraine again in 2014, um, um, and Crimea. Uh, the situation we have in Ukraine today, with Crimea just being incorporated into having been uh, annexed into the Russian Federation and something not dissimilar possibly going to happen in um, eastern Ukraine and continuing violence. Um, the focus of uh, Russian competitive thinking, and if you like, parallel thinking, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States, I and mean, when I deal with this and look at this um, a great deal, um, uh, there's constant comparison. Russia, the United States, is the same thing. I take you back to those GDP statistics at the beginning of the presentation. Of course, it's not the same thing, not remotely. And somehow or another, that isn't challenged. Director of National Intelligence, um, quoted, quoting from his statement to Congress um, earlier on this year, in 2017, Russia is likely to be more assertive in global affairs, more unpredictable in its approach to the United States, and more authoritarian in its um, approach to domestic uh, politics. That assertiveness is going to be focused especially on Europe and especially on the Middle East, and it may seem less important here in Asia, but of course with the assertion and the self-confidence which goes with the assertion, you have the possibility, the temptation to mess around or to interfere if opportunity arises, e.g. in Korea. Uh, but also, you know, other parts of East Asia where interesting possibilities and relationships exist uh, for them. It isn't just uh, military power and territory. Um, there are, of course, significant developments in politics. Uh, presidential election next year. I don't think there's any doubt that President Putin will win uh, that um, election, assuming he stands, which I sort of am assuming. Um, but he's not got just to win, he's got to have a really high turnout. The turnout for the state Duma elections in September last year nationally was under 50%. In Petersburg and Moscow, it was at 35 and less uh, percent. There's a high degree of apathy. They're worried about that. They're worried about corruption accusations for which the president gets some of the blame. Um, <coughs> and um, if any of you haven't, if you haven't seen the video, 50 minute video by Alexei Navalny on uh, the corrupt activities of Prime Minister Medvedev, as he alleges, uh, then it's worth watching. 20 million, other, 1 million other people have watched it already. And of course, there's the economy, and that's just a sort of final fact check on the economy. Um, it's stabilized, uh, stabilized being the word, from a low base, uh, and note the decline in real wages, which is what actually means, you know, that's what people take home every day, and that's across the country, what people have to put up with. Um, uh, the Australian, um, the GDP figure may be the same as the Russian Federation, but I don't think you face that in your um, weekly pay packets. Um, <coughs> in other words, it's not settled down. And we worry about it. It's a really major issue in, in, in the UK and in Europe, and of course, famously, in the United States. Finally, finally, um, I, I have to say just something briefly about two final things. The EU, uh, the future of the EU, and what is going to be happening with US policy. They're interlinked, uh, really. There's been so much debate about the EU. Um, we've, we've had elections in France which have actually turned out surprisingly well for people who believe, uh, as an awful lot of people do in the future, of a united uh, Europe, and there's a strong push, I was just in France last week, there's a strong push behind uh, Macron and his party in the legislative elections, which are gonna start first round on Sunday, which is remarkable, given that he started from nothing 
um, a, a year ago with not even an established party. Um, elections coming up in Germany, um, where Chancellor Merkel, um, who's a uh, remarkably impressive uh, uh, politician and leader, um, uh, looks to be uh, re-strengthening her position, but of course a huge series of questions around the relationship between France and, and Germany, which is the core issue regarding the future um, of, of Europe. There's a lot of encouraging talk about that at the moment. Actually, what will happen in practice, we don't yet, we don't yet know. The key issues are around fiscal policy and the move to effectively some kind of European level um, involvement in the management of uh, Germany's resources, which, as you can imagine, you know, is an awkward subject in Berlin. Um, and then, of course, a reminder that things aren't clear yet. We're quite possibly going to have elections in Italy um, before the end of the year, if the negotiations there between the parties uh, sort themselves out. An impressive politician in Matteo Renzi, uh, but the five-star movement of Beppe Grillo um, is scoring 30% plus in the opinion polls and is the largest uh, scorer at present. Uh, so there's a lot to play for. My only final personal comment on that would be that certainly in the UK and in the US and possibly in Australia, there's a great tendency to underestimate the degree of commitment within the European Union, the original members of it, that is, uh, to the future of Europe and the belief in a united Europe. In Anglo-Saxon countries, there's a tendency not to take that seriously. But if you live there, work there, or go there a lot, you know uh, that it's much more complicated uh, uh, than that. There's been a consistent um, tendency to underestimate. <coughs> and there's the hopeful uh, thing being said by the Chancellor. And finally, 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 the US um, and uh, President Trump and everything else going on around him. I travel around a lot. Um, I hear lots of questions. I sort of sense what everybody is thinking about. Um, and everywhere I go, I find people asking about this. It affects everyone. Everyone and every country is thinking about it. It goes back to my original point that the US is by far the most powerful country in the world. Um, and what happens there affects and everybody, and everybody's trying to understand the significance of current US behavior, and they don't understand. It's just a fact, it's not an opinion, it's a fact uh, that people are unsettled. Leading and highly respected members of the administration are traveling, seeking to reassure um, allies and friends uh, around the world, but it's hard for them to be completely successful given what has been said and some of the behavior, and indeed not said, around NATO, uh, what has been said and done around the Paris Climate um, Accord, about the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, um, and of course, the political turmoil in Washington. This goes back to the region. The way US policy evolves in the South China Sea um, with China, the way it evolves in the Middle East with Iran, and above all, and most immediately, the way it evolves in North Korea is really going to be critically important in helping us to read the period ahead. Thank you very much.